Okay, thanks. Um, so what I would like to do is take some of the considerations from Stas's talk and, and apply them to this to the ideas of uh, MRI simulations and see what kind of uh, what kind of ideas come out. So let me try to be a little bit more concrete and um, you know look at some results of numerical simulations. So this is the poster that is sitting outside, but just so that we have some picture in ahead of what we're talking about. So this is, you know, a model of the MRI in a cylindrical, oh, in a cylindrical. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's just for recording. So, okay, so this is a model of the MRI in a cylindrical annulus. You have uh, outer and inner cylinders. The inner one is rotating faster than the outer one. You fill it up with some conducting fluid. Um, the boundary conditions are idealized, so they are periodic in the vertical, and in the absence of magnetic field or magnetic effects, this thing is just going to go in quiet uh, rotation, and it doesn't do very much. And then the idea is that if you apply some magnetic field, let's say an axial magnetic field, um, then it should do something interesting. And uh, indeed it does, and hopefully this afternoon we'll actually see the sort of experimental, you know, manifestation of this thing when we go and see the lab. But to give you some idea what what um, one it would do. Of course, this is in completely the wrong parameter regime for the experiment. This has got very high magnetic Reynolds number and, and not so large uh, Reynolds number, which is which is completely wrong for, for gallium. But uh, you get an idea of what this thing does. So this is the inner cylinder. That's the outer cylinder. So this is like a cut. It's a meridional cut through that box over there and what you're seeing are the velocity, the azimuthal velocity fluctuations and the coding is like if it's bright is going faster than the average and if it's dark is going slower than the average. So what you're seeing you can almost sort of work out who's transporting what. If you have bright stuff that is going out is transporting angular momentum out and if you have dark stuff coming in it's transporting angular momentum out. All right. <laughs> And if you turn it to the side, it looks an awful lot like convection. And this is sort of, you know, the same quantity only in sort of volumetric rendering, which doesn't really help you very much, but it looks cute and helps you get funding and all of those things. <laughs> sure. And so these are for an incompressible fluid, finite viscosity and magnetic diffusivity. So this is a code which resolves. Um, no, this is the velocity fluctuations, the same quantity as this, I think. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Um, and what we know for, uh, these are magnetic parental numbers a half, and what we know for sure, for sure we know that at a Reynolds number of 6,000, this thing is not a dynamo. So if you leave it alone, it will just go back to coet flow. And we seem to think that it's probably a dynamo of 60,000. And so, probably means because we, we can't really run this thing for, for, for forever. It's just a very expensive simulation. But let's assume that it is. So somewhere in between, somewhere between 6,000 and 60,000, this thing kind of turns on a dynamo. And the question that we want to really sort of understand, if I keep making this number smaller and smaller and smaller, and I have infinite resources or I have some remarkable way of constructing very large experiment, can I always get this thing? to come back to life and, and work. So can I just increase the Reynolds number as much as I want? Sorry to be technical. Yeah. What is the uh, initial field configuration? Okay, uh, so the initial field configuration is that this was continued by a previous simulation with a uniform field by setting the uniform component to zero. Okay, so, so, right, okay. So, I in other words, this thing has no net flux, but that's how it was started. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Mark Martin, did you have a question? Why the number 60,000 will make You mean the probably? Yes. Because we, we run it for a while, <laughs> and, you know, and it's, you know, you, you can always say, you know, I think it's a dynamo, and the typical dynamo theorists will say, you have to run it for an ohmic decay time, and you say, well, we can't do that. So they say, oh, well, then you can't be sure it's a dynamo. So it's probably a dynamo. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, as far as we can tell, this thing doesn't die on you, but we haven't run it forever. So if we could run it forever, we'd be a lot more certain. So the question, you know, so I just, th that's just the picture. So, you know, can we always get this thing to work if we had our way? 
And there are two issues that are related to the dynamo. One is really sort of, you know, very much what Stas was talking about, which is, you know, there's a possibility that you say dynamo action just becomes plain impossible. You know, th there's a critical Prandtl number below which you just cannot do it, you'll never be able to do it, and that's it. And the turbulence decay, and there's no enhanced transport, and this thing just kind of goes around in circles, and nothing much happens. There is another possibility, which is separate and should not be confused, is that dynamo action is always possible, but the amplitude of the fluctuations just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, so it goes to zero as the Prandtl number goes to zero, in which case you think, okay, even if this thing is working is not really a very efficient, uh, g doesn't give rise to efficient transport, the transport goes to zero or get, gets as small as I want, and that would not be useful. But but these are comp they're separate things because this is a like kind of dynamical question, and th this has got to do with the amplitudes, and this has got to do with the sort of growth rate. Yeah. Right. So suppose that you could do it, and and still you think, oh, yes, but for anything, you know, I can always make it smaller, 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 smaller by decreasing the magnetic Prandtl number, so that the amplitude goes to zero. So this is what worries. Martin, I suppose, is that the amplitude of the fluctuations, the delta B goes to zero as a magnetic parental. So th that's a dynamical thing. So I want to sort of discuss them separately. Um, so this is the picture that we had on yesterday, which is, which relates to the first issue, which is, you know, can I always <laughs> drive a dynamo? And by now we know, I mean, uh, uh, Stas has gone through this exercise and, and, and sort of presented the, these arguments that the general indication is that it's always possible. You may have to work very hard, and in a second I'm going to try to figure out exactly how hard you have to work to get this thing. But, you know, the two possibilities for the dynamo is, is like there's this critical number below which just that's it, it's impossible. So that would be the blue curve. Or it's always possible, you just have to go, you know, if you put a very small value of the, of the parental number, magnetic parental number, you know, you may have to go to very, very high um, Reynolds number, and the, exactly how this thing goes to zero, if it goes to zero as one over the Prandtl number, it means if the magnetic Reynolds number becomes independent, otherwise there may be some l residual dependence. But, uh, you know, it's one or the other, and Stas has just argued that in fact it's, it's probably it's the red curve, all right? But the trouble is that even though it's possible, it may be hard to do. And, and, and so what I want to discuss is exactly how hard is it. So let's assume that, okay, the re large Reynolds number regime is doable. How large is large, we'll, we'll see in a moment. But let's say that we are in this regime, so large Reynolds number. So if this thing is excited, it could well become turbulent and then what we need to do is address this issue that Stas discussed in great gory details, which is driving a dynamo in a strongly fluctuating velocity. And the quantity that, that we need is this, this exponent gamma, which is called the roughness exponent or the holder exponent. Uh, anyway, how is it defined operationally? You can work it out by looking at the sort of second order longitudinal structure functions. So you take velocity differences at a position x, so you, you take this difference here, you dot it into the unit vector along the displacement, you square them, and you look how they behave as a function of L. Of course, to go from here to here, you've assumed that this thing is kind of isotropic, homogeneous, all of those things, but you know, let's just, you know, not be too concerned about such issues at the moment, and if it has a scaling behavior which is like L to the power of two something, the something is this rough, roughness exponent, and the important property is that if this exponent is one, then you're dealing with a nice function, the functions that, you know, you learned about in school, the kind of, you know, things that your grandmother gave you on Sunday for breakfast. You know, that's so just <laughs> functions that are smooth and differentiable and you can do nice things to them. If this gamma is less than one, then these are bizarre functions. They're like, you know, Wiener processes. There are things that keep jumping up and down all over the place and in particular, they don't have derivatives. Okay? So the way to think about it is that gamma equal one functions like you're used to, and the other one is just a mess that just goes all over the place. 
And the Kolmogorov one is, is one third. This is the famous, you know, Kolmogorov um, four fifths rule. Well, not strictly speaking, it's the third order structure function is linear, but blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so one third, it's a pretty rough velocity. Let's put it that way. Okay? And if you don't like, uh, you know, this thing, you like energy spectrum, you know, if the energy spectrum does cos k to the minus p, then p is just one plus two gamma. So you can go back and forth between spectra and, and roughness exponents. But it turns out that it's better <laughs> for this kind of stuff to stick to physical space and roughness exponents that go to spectra and, and you know, spectral indices. Now, a few quick things. If you have an integral scale L0, and this is the scale at which diffusion takes in and smooths out your functions, okay? So if you have a diffusive process, eventually, no matter how much you wiggle, this thing will wipe it out, okay? It will turn it into a nice, smooth, differentiable function kind of thing grandmothers like. And the, this, how it behaves with Reynolds number, magnetic Reynolds number, is in this combination. So you can think of this number here, meaning how many viscous boundary layer you have to stick in a row to get this length. And this length depends on the roughness exponent and on the Reynolds number. Bigger Reynolds number, the more you have to stick in a row. And again, so that this is the one that we're going to need in a little bit, is that the magnetic parental number, you can just think as the, as the separation between the, the, the scale at which the magnetic fields become smooth and the scale at which the velocity becomes smooth. And again, sort of, this funny exponent enters in there. Everything depends on, on this exponent, okay? Now, the thing is that, okay, what is this exponent? So if you take an actual simulation, so what I did, I took a shearing box simulation of MRI with a uniform field. This, this is not a zero mean field. This had a, because I really wanted this thing to work. I didn't want to have battle against it. And so, uh, his a thermal equation of state, finite vertical flux, using Pluto, no explicit dissipation. So this is the kind of thing that, you know, all of us have been running for, for, for many years now. And, and this is what those structure functions, the second order structure functions look like for this, for, you know, for your typical shearing box simulation. I think I, I, I took the azimuthal velocity, but it doesn't make much difference which one you use. So this is L, and this is this, you know, delta U squared. So if, what you want to know is how this thing behaves as a function of L. Notice that even though I don't have any dissipation in this code, so I mean, in some crazy sense, I could say I'm solving the ideal MHD equations. Of course, there are numerical dissipations. So you say, like, yeah, like hell you are. And thank God, this thing all by itself goes to a slope of 2 down here, which means the numerical dissipation, whether you like it or not, smooths out your functions at small scale. So this is L of one grid points, two grid points, three grid points, four grid points. So this is telling you that over about five grid points, functions look smooth. Okay, even if you have no dissipation, your code will do it for you. All right? So you see, this is two, the slope of two. So slope of two is a, is a sort of perfectly sensible function. And then he sort of keels over and he goes over to this bizarre wiggly behavior, which is what you expect. So this, this would be the inertial range. So th <laughs> this thing, if you turn it around, you're just taking the FFT of it. But the point is that what we're interested in, in is, is this area. And if you do the, the spectral analysis of this, it always ends up over here where, where you can't figure out what, what on earth is going on, okay? So this slope here, the important thing for this thing is that it is definitely not two. So th they're rough. I mean, that's the point. How rough it is, it's actually, for this case, is a little bit rougher than one third. So it's closer to a quarter than a third. So, which is not good news. But anyway, so the other important thing is that this is where your code begins to correctly represent a wiggly function. So a rough function looks like this to a code, where this is 50 grid points, all right? So the bad news is that if it takes you five grid points to represent the gradient of a nice smooth function, unfortunately, it takes of the order of 50 or 60 grid points to represent the holder derivative of a rough function. 
um, this is Pluto. So um, it may move a tiny bit in or out, but I, c I doubt that unless you have some crazy way of solving stochastic, I mean, unless you have a, a representation for stochastic processes that I don't know what it is, you're not going to get this, you know, down here. I'm sorry? Right, so this thing is just computed at one time. So I just kind of, you know, took the box. It does, it does, but we haven't even got to that yet. So, I mean, I'm just saying that in this scheme, I mean, if I were, if I were to address the issue using Pluto, you know, just take Pluto or, or Zeus or whatever, and I want to address this issue of the small magnetic Prandtl number problem, you know, what does that mean? It means that if I start off, okay, so this thing has no explicit dissipation, so I just couldn't do it with this code. But if I were to introduce finite diffusivity for the magnetic field and I start making it larger and larger and larger, I would have initially a curve that wouldn't look that dissimilar from this one for the magnetic field. And really what I want to do is take the magnetic field curve and displace it until this part of the magnetic field begins to sit somewhere here. That's what I want to do. That is the problem that is being discussed by all of us over these days. But immediately you see that this is not an easy problem because it means that the magnetic boundary layers has, to, you know, the earliest that I can get them to work is to get them up here. Which means I have to have a magnetic boundary layer which even before I start is about 50 grid points thick for the magnetic boundary layer to see a properly fluctuating function, okay? So that's not very good news. I mean, as I say, you, you may luck out and this may sort of have a sort of slump, somewhat sharper corner. It may be 30, maybe, it's not going to be two. <laughs> and it's, it's still going to be quite a few, okay? This is just data. This is just, I'm saying, this is an MRI simulation. And this is where this code begins to see a wiggly, you know. That's where it begins to see an inertial range. And I have to put my boundary layer in the inertial range. And the inertial range in this thing starts at about 50 grid points. And I, I'm, I'm claiming that with the kind of codes that all of us have, we're not going to get it down to anything other than a few tens of grid points. All right? I'm sorry? No, no, no. This is with Pluto. This is a finite difference code. I don't think so. <laughs> because spectral is still, you know, spectral codes are all, in fact, it, they're even worse because they're all based on the idea that you're dealing with smooth functions, you know. All, this, so this one, in a sense, is all based on polynomials. And spectral, they're, they're based on orthogonal polynomials. But polynomials, they are. What I'm saying is that there are some funny techniques to solve stochastic problems that, that you actually have stochastic basis functions. But, I mean, I don't know how to write codes with those things, honestly. L equal here. Oh, okay, so, uh, right, confusing issue. This has to be a symmetric curve, right? Because it's a periodic domain. So once you've gone half the box along, get going further out is the same as coming back. So this is actually symmetric. It's just that it's an o on a log plot. It doesn't look symmetric. But this thing will have to reach a maximum and then boom, boom, go down the other side, which is more things. More bad news because it tells you that even if you want to have, you know, 50 thingies, you know, already sort of like a 128 point calculation is just sitting here. It's just barely getting into the inertial range and you die on you. Yes, but then you're in the sort of wrong PM regime, right? Then you're in the large PM regime. I want to do this small PM regime, which I guess I'm not going to be able to finish, but I'll do some of it. <laughs> so, okay. Well, this is good. I mean, if we just get one message across, it, it's good. So, okay. Let's assume that this holds, that I need at least 50 grid points to represent the wiggly function. So that's the thickness of my boundary layers for the magnetic field so that I can properly address the issue of a fluctuating velocity. Then we go back to Stas's curve, which is... You know, how hard do you have to work to excite a dynamo in a rough velocity field? The roughness 
is up here, okay? So this is for Kolmogorov. But let's assume that we're somewhere here rather than down here, okay? So if it's rough, we're somewhere up there. And what this axis is, is exactly what we need, which is this number tells you the number of boundary layers that you need to stick next to each other to contain the growing eigenfunction. Okay, so you can just read it off. If it's a smooth thing, you need about four boundary layers and you're done. If you're rough, you need of the order of 30. Okay, that's how it is. You know, there's nothing I can do about it. So this is increasing roughness. So if things are like this, they may be better, they may be worse, but if they're like this, this thing tells you you need about 30 boundary layers in a row so that you have a growing eigenfunction. So now you go back to where you were and you think, holy banana, look at this. One boundary layer is 50 grid points and I need 30 of them in a row. That's 1,500 grid points just to get the growing eigenfunction then this thing is periodic. So I really need 3,000 of these damn things. And if I want to supercritical, knock yourself out four or 5,000 grid points. So, so there you go. Now I've depressed everybody in the room, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's it. I mean, unless there is something that invalidates this analysis and you say, well, I may come up with, you know, hyper this and, and super that, and I may shave off a factor of two or three over here, and maybe we luck out, it's not 30, it's 20. Maybe there are coherent structures, and so wonderful, terrific things happen. But if you just kind of do, a, not even the worst case scenario, but a realistic scenario, that's the kind of stuff that you get, is that you, ne you need simulations of many thousands of grid points to address this small magnetic parental number issue. And there was this formula that I just wrote down, which was, ooh, no, 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 this one. Okay, so this tells you the kind of magnetic parental number that you have to put in there so that you're in the sort of right regime. And the right regime is that you got here and going further up doesn't really make any difference because it's not that it's getting any rougher. I mean, as you climb up by decreasing the, you, you see it's rougher, 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 rougher. So things get worse, 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 and then they just stay bad, okay? But they don't get any worse. <laughs> and so you think, okay, so what is the parental number that I need to go to make sure that I just got here and things are not gonna get any worse? Well, if this is five and this is 50, then the ratio of those two things is a tenth, and so you need a magnetic parental number, which is a tenth to the four thirds, which is about 0 0.046 or something like that. So that, this tells you, is what? This, this estimate is actually about right for when yeah. you start getting down more energy. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's analysis still works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Vindic numerical vindication of an analytic result. So, so, you know, so this is it. So basically, this tells you that the calculations you need are going to be big. And, uh, and the magnetic parental numbers that you need to get into this sort of asymptotic, asymptotic here means such that, you know, if you go to further, as uh, to even smaller magnetic parental number, nothing terrible happens. But, you know, you have to work very hard to get there. So now let me just, so that was issue number one. What do we need to do to address that issue? And unfortunately, I think that's what we need to do. Not that I'm saying that we should do it, but that's what it's needed. And then this again, so I can go through very quickly, because I think in a sense we, we, we looked at it yesterday, which is suppose that you now address this issue of the amplitude of the fluctuation. So the effective transport de depends on sort of quadratic correlations. And um, so things can go wrong because either you lose the correlation, those two quantities becomes decorrelated, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Or things go bad because the amplitude of the fluctuations gets small. And I was saying yesterday, there are other systems, not the MRI, but there are other systems in which it is known that if you look at sort of what is the sort of kind of typical fluctuations that you can generate for a unit <laughs> of vorticity. So somebody gives you a unit of vorticity and you say, what can you do with this eddy? And you say, what is the maximum? Or what's the typical magnetic fluctuation you can sustain with that eddy? You get scalings that look like this. In other words, there are scaling that go to zero as the mag you know, magnetic parental number goes to zero. But luckily, at least, you know, okay, some good news. This thing doesn't apply at small magnetic parental numbers. So, 
but it tells you that you have to be extremely careful to take results that are derived of magnetic quantum numbers of one or bigger and <laughs> put a line through it because this is precisely what you shouldn't do. And if you look at the boundary layer analysis that you have to use to do this, it screams at you. It says, you know, don't use me, you know, if PM is less than one. I mean, it really sort of yells very loud. You can do numerics and, you know, as I say, not in the MRI, but in other fields like magnetoconvection, people have done them. They're painful like you wouldn't believe. But, you know, that's the kind of thing you have to do. This is magnetic parental number of eight and one eighth. So this is a convection simulation. You're looking sort of from the top. And sort of these are the magnetic fluctuation, vorticity fluctuation. So the regime you want to be in is the one where the magnetic boundary layers are thick and the vorticity boundary layers are thi tiny, tiny. I mean, I had to, you know, they were so tiny, I had to sort of amplify, you couldn't see anything. These things are smaller than, than the resolution of the thing. And try to monitor what happens. And as I say, you don't have analytic results to help you because it's, you can't do the analysis. You can't do boundary layer analysis in that regime. But, for instance, you get curves like this one. So this is, for instance, the, um, well, some people would call it the L2 norm, but it's the sort of magnetic energy that you can generate by that convecting flow as a function of magnetic parental number. And you can see for magnetic parental numbers bigger than one, this thing keeps going down, 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 exactly as predicted by that formula. But it would be, it would be erroneous to just kind of, you know, keep going because, as I said, you know, this thing doesn't really apply below one. And then the evidence numeric, such as it is, is that this thing levels off. And in some kind of hand-waving way, that is what you expect. You expect, I mean, you can produce semi-convincing <laughs> arguments <laughs> that this thing should level off. I mean, I don't know how to produce any rigorous arguments that this thing should level off. But the thing that I can guarantee is that if you use your intuition from this part of the graph to figure out what's going on, uh, that's bad news. I mean, you're just going to get it wrong. And so let me conclude. Um, so my conclusion would, would be that the present simulations that have been run with, with, you know, reasonable thing up to maybe 512, but more typically 128, you know, 256 grid points are, are just like not suitable to inform us about you know, the small PM regime. Why? Because, because these objects, what they do is they represent smooth functions. So what we know is an awful lot about the MRI when everything is smooth, when everything is differentiable and nothing wiggles too much. As soon as you go into this wiggly regime, you don't really know very much because th that kind of simulation can inform you about it. And all we know is what is happening as you were climbing up the curve. And, and what all you could see is that things are getting worse. <laughs> well, when I talk about it, I, I mean the real one, the real sort of, you know, honest to goodness, uh, you know, Laplacian with a constant in front. But Right, so the, the simulations that have no explicit resolution, you can think of them as simulations that have an effective magnetic parental number, which is something of order one, but goes knows what. Otherwise, people put it in explicitly, then it's whatever you put it in, so long as, you're, you know, so long as your resolution is, is correct and you've done your numerics right. So it depends, but the, greater major the greatest majority of simulations up to a point um, were with no explicit dissipation and therefore had an, an effective magnetic parental number, which was some number of order one, who knows. So I, I would maintain that that is true. Um, as far as I can tell, there is no result, theoretical or numerical, that indicates that the dynamo action becomes impossible as more PM. I would say that there are results that indicate that it should be possible, but I definitely don't know of any convincing evidence, theoretical or otherwise, that tells you that this thing is impossible. I mean, people claim it, but I mean, I can claim all sorts of things. Um, that doesn't make them true. The other thing is that, again, sort of, you know, oh, we must not use the, you know, whatever we understand about the PM greater than one regime to figure out what's going on, because it's just completely different physics. 
It's just like, you know, in one case you can neglect advection of vorticity, in the other case it's all advection of vorticity. And, you know, in one case are smooth functions, the other case are fluctuating functions. So, so this would be catastrophic. And so finally, which is, you know, an interesting, in an, an interesting question for debate is that, okay, we can run informative simulations on this thing. There'll be, you know, m several thousand big. Uh, the machines to do them are available. They're online. They exist. You can we, can, we could apply to them and say, can I please have many, 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 you know, few weeks of CPU time on all on your, you know, whatever, 64,000 processors, and you can probably run these things through. They're very, very demanding. So a good question is like, should we do it? Or let's wait five years and the machine get bigger and we can do it. I mean, I don't know. I honestly have no idea. But I mean, this is an interesting question for debate. I mean, uh, is it a sufficiently important problem that we are, you know, morally entitled to go and ask such kind of resources to figure it out? And uh, with that thing, I thank you all for your attention. Okay, yes. No, no. I, as far as I know, no. But I mean, I suppose that that is a very, very valid point. So. And I have something more than just. Oh. And I have a reason for thinking that might be true. No, no, I, I know. Okay. Yeah. But maybe the one way to say it is that this, what, what this does is outlines the, you know, a program that gives you the worst case scenario. So you think you could start not at this, you know, this crazy resolution and build yourself up with the understanding that if you're lucky, this thing will do the honorable thing before you get to these ridiculous resources, but you have to prepare yourself that you may have to go all the way to these, you know, thousand and thousand cube simulations. I, I, if your argument doesn't kick in and save the day, then, you know, like Stas's argument will save the day at <laughs> these crazy resolutions, I think. <laughs> I'm sorry? Cartesian shear calculation, right? Yeah. The same issue would come up. Oh, this. this and I thought at smaller scales, things tended to isotropize. Um, yeah, I mean, there's still no getting around this issue that as I don't know of any way of representing a wiggly function with, with, with a lot less than that many grid points. I mean, that, that's it. Because. If I smooth them out, if I use hyper-resistivity, if I use an LES, or if I use anything that returns to me a smooth function, I'm not doing the problem that I should be doing. I'm doing the other problem, dynamo by smooth velocities, which by now we've beaten to death. So the issue is like, how do we study numerically dynamos with, with, with wiggly velocity? And, and that's it, that's it. Right, right. And you, you know, cheat somewhere away to get weight payouts. Yeah. That's right. But you know what, for instance, okay, okay, uh, okay. Th this is a way of cheating, for instance. Um, this has got nothing to do with the MRI, nothing whatsoever. But it's, it's a dynamo that, I, that Steve Tobias and I constructed in such a way that you can do a 2D problem. So this would be the extreme case of what you want. This is, you know, zero resolution in one direction. And then it was like 4,000 by 4,000 this way. And, and, and this velocity is, is rough. I mean, it's a really, really rough velocity. I mean, I can't remember what the, what, what the spectrum is, but it's rough as hell. And I could actually solve the induction equation for this thing because, oops, sorry, uh, because it was in, um, in two dimension. And so I could do it. Um, and, uh, and, and there you go. If I, I ever get back where it was, I can show you what it looks like. But, um, okay, so this was so artificial that, I mean, I'm not going to even 
tell you what it is because it's kind of embarrassing. It was, it was constructed in this crazy way just so that it would be two-dimensional so that we could, you know, go 4,000, 4,000 and solve this thing. So that's the, these are the magnetic fluctuations. These are the velocity fluctuations. And, and this is the kind of stuff that you have to put up with. And, and it just fills me with, with horror, the thought that I have to stick another 4,000 grid points going <laughs> this way. That's the thing. I mean, this one we did, and we were exhausted at the end of it. And, and being 4,000 times more exhausted just doesn't cheer me up at all. So that's the thing. OK. Um, the trouble is that <laughs> you can't see anything on this picture because you know, this is 4,000 by 4,000, and, and I don't know what the resolution of this thing is. It's not very much, but if you go and check, there are these little vortices here which are totally minuscule. And so. No, it's flat. No, the vorticity spectrum. Well, it's not a matter of spectrum. The spectrum is, is where the cutoffs are that, that counts, not so much. The, the actual spectra. I, I was saying this is a simulation where the velocity was really rough. Okay, so this was a really rough velocity, and I could fix the magnetic Reynolds number in such a way that it was big enough that it was still a dynamo, and yet the magnetic parental number was small. So it was really operating in the rough regime of this thing. But, but it was horrible. I mean, it was 4,000 by 4,000, and, and as I say, I really don't. I mean, even if you just say, okay, we can get away with a thousand, you know, a hundred this way still. Anyway. Um. <laughs> right. Here. Right, but, but, okay, but then you're not in this asymptote, meaning then, then you make it a little bit smaller and things get worse. So you're still in this thing that you decrease the magnetic parental number, this thing dies on you, and it dies, and it dies, and it dies. So you need to get here to make sure that this thing doesn't die anymore. Is that, is that clear? Hmm? As you further decrease the magnetic parental number. Because decreasing the magnetic parental number just kind of moves you up this curve. Right. It, 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 they are. I mean, w w we could go to Argon tomorrow, ask them to give us time on their BGP and, and, and do it. The question is, <laughs> should we go tomorrow morning and ask them <laughs> to do it? I mean, I mean, what I don't want is to go ask and do it, kill myself in a few, you know, postdoc in the process, and then next time we have this meeting, Somebody, him, stands up and says, look at that schmuck how he used it. <laughs> I can't believe they did that. <laughs> that I would really not like. <laughs> not him. I mean, him as in, you know, the, the invisible man. You know what I mean? That, that would be really annoying. <laughs> I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying, you know, let's figure out if now is the time and this is something that we really want to do. I'm sorry? But they are, it's so easy to sell, you know, you go to your guys at Congress, say, you know, we're figuring out the shape of the universe, they'll give you anything. You, with this one, you have to go there and start saying, there is this thing which is the parental number, which is the, it's like this guy who looks, well, what are you talking about? And I say, those guys have just figured out that the universe looks like a banana and you're still <laughs> talking about it. It's like, uh. so that's, 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 <laughs> that's the thing. That's a good segue into the, the shortened discussion period. Right, what so. What should we be doing with our time? <laughs>